Um, my name is Carolyn Newley. This is Sam Parker, Emily Hines, and Stella Lee. And we're a team of undergraduate student researchers from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about our research project from this past summer, the musical geography of 1920s Paris, um, which was conducted as a part of St. Olaf's non-funded Digital Humanities on the Hill initiative. Musicologists have long used maps to contextualize the relationship between sound, time, and place, yet have been slow to embrace the potential of digital mapping for making place itself the focus of inquiry. With the advent of relatively accessible GIS tools, musicologists stand to benefit enormously from new research and data visualization methods. In this presentation, we demonstrate how our attention to place rather than text provokes new research questions and brings music history to life. The Musical Geography of 1920s Paris is a web-based resource that uses maps as spatial visualizations to reconstruct the musical life of a particularly vibrant period in music history. The 1920, in the 1920s, artists, writers, dancers, and musicians from around the world flocked to the city for its abundant concert venues and relatively cheap cost of living. Paris additionally served as a home base for numerous performing organizations, including several ballet companies whose international tours spread French music throughout the world. Traditional narratives of interwar French music focus on composers' contribution to developments in musical styles and aesthetics. Our maps turn attention instead to the place-dependent roles of musical institutions and individuals. For example, by mapping Parisian musical venues by style, jazz, classical music, lyric theater, popular song, we can better understand where in the city certain types of music were being made, or sometimes not being made. Crucially, several of our maps incorporate a new and inter interactive chronological feature, making it possible for researchers and students to explore the diachronic evolution of the Parisian scene. And unlike traditional scholarship, our web-based maps allow us to embed or link to digitized primary source documents, like historical newspapers and other media, including sound, thus opening place-oriented visual, sonic, and contextual archival exploration to a wide audience. Applying insight from recent scholarship in the digital and effective humanities our project focuses on developing a set of interactive map-based tools for musicology research and pedagogy. As Todd Kresner argues in Hypercities, Think Mapping in the Digital Humanities, our context-laden maps are, quote, conjoined with stories, rendering them infinitely extensible and participatory, end quote. Historian and digital humanities advocate T. Mills Kelly contends that, quote, a map is a historical source that makes an argument all its own. And we have found that the maps we've made did just that. In order to actually create our maps, we refer to several precedent digital humanity models, such as Digital Harlem by historians from University of Sydney in Australia, and Early Modern London by professors from Oxford and Victoria University in England. In addition, we used a variety of different platforms each of which came with its own set of strengths and challenges. We began with making simple Google Maps, but as our data expanded, we branched out to explore the Cardo and ArcGIS platforms, which eventually housed most of our maps. Each, map, each mapping application we have worked with has its drawbacks, but each has strengths as well. Cardo, ArcGIS, and Google Maps have have each brought up project to life in different ways. So digital humanities work hasn't only informed our project's goals, it's also directly impacted the process of how we conducted our research. A great deal of it was conducted through digitized and text-mined archives, such as Gallica, which is curated by the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Using Gallica, we were able to search and view concert listings and reviews from several significant French newspapers from the time, such as the Figaro and the Ministre. However, many relevant archival sources remain outside the purview of the digital world today. So to supplement available secondary resources and digitize primary sources, I traveled to Paris to consult the BNF archives in person. 
The physical concert programs, magazines, and press collections there helped fill in missing data, and the visit as a whole provided an opportunity to collect media and images to use within our maps. My trip to Paris also helped fulfill our goal of increasing access to information contained in non-digitized materials. So far, our research has yielded incredible amounts of data. Over the past two years, participants in this project have collected more than 4,500 uh, performances, mostly from the 1920s and the surrounding period. Two summers ago, the original team collected the first 1,300 of these records, storing the data in one big Google spreadsheet, which is what you see on the screen before you. Um, the spreadsheet was easy to share and see, but typos are inevitable, and it's difficult to filter the data in the ways that we wanted to. Last summer, knowing that we'd be adding thousands of new records, our team decided to experiment with a different way to store our data. Using SQL, PHP, HTML, and jQuery, and more, we built an online, publicly accessible database that allows students, teachers, and researchers from all over the world to view and contribute to our data set. Because why not? Users can filter the records by date, venue, performing group, repertoire, and more. We included a generate map button that creates instant visualizations. It's just a simple sort of Google map that uses the JavaScript API. And we provided a way to export data as a CSV file to be uploaded later to a more sophisticated mapping platform like Carter or ArcGIS. Um, in addition, we incorporated a web form that makes it easy for students to record performance details. So between its ease of use and collaborative nature, our online database is a textbook example of how digital tools can turn research and pedagogy into kind of a community effort. Now a large goal of our research has been to emphasize how the digital humanities may be used to help us look at the history in different ways. Within the individual case study we conducted on the Valley Roofs, for example, we, are now able, we were able to show palpable evidence of the benefits of utilizing modern technology. Here, you can see an ArcGIS story map of all of the maps we have created thus far with the data from almost 3,000 performances of the Valley Roofs. Not only are we able to easily compare what the different maps say with the same data, but we are also able to compare the mapping platforms themselves side by side. For example, you can compare the pop-up configuration of data points in Google Maps, Cardo, and ArcGIS. Furthermore, the online database lets us draw new conclusions about how we have historically viewed the Valley Roofs. They were originally known for their avant-garde performances, and to this day, they are best known for their premiere of the controversial, riot-inducing ballet by Igor Stravinsky, The Rite of Spring. The infamy of their premiere has inspired several modernizations of this performance, and we'll show you a clip from one of those. <laughs> were most 
mostly bars, nightclubs, and small cabarets, many of which were owned and operated by the large number of American expatriates who lived in the area. Yet a second, smaller cluster appears in the center of the city, in a more traditional theater and opera district. The heat map can thus provide at a glance confirmation that the older, more traditional Parisian entertainment venues, such as review theaters and music halls, had begun to incorporate jazz into their program programming material during the 1920s. Often the two jazz centers within the city drew different audiences and supported different currents of early jazz style. The next jazz map uses the same set of data, but it represents each venue individually. This particular map stands as an early proof of concept model as we work towards building maps with embedded images and media links. As you can see, clicking on pop-ups can show a photo, give background information about the building, or provide digitized archival material about that venue. For example, when clicking on the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées, you can see a pop-up with the venue's photo, brief history, and even a link to a YouTube video of the famous Josephine Baker performing her infamous banana skirt dance there. So our goal is that in creating media-rich maps like this, we can help students immerse themselves more fully in their study of the past and of music history, and to imagine that history in a new and more personally engaged light. Our spatially oriented research has inspired new questions about music in 1920s Paris. How exactly did the French define jazz? And how often was jazz really heard? What music was made and consumed in the eastern third of Paris, where recent immigrants and working class Parisians lived, and where few formal venues existed? The research required to answer these questions renders Parisian spaces something other than mere context for traditional musicological analysis. The city stands as its own musical text, full of sound and awaiting further exploration via interactive mapping. Thank you very much.
say because with like finale of roofs there's almost 3,000 performances so you can't have a picture and a YouTube link and all that in every single pop-up mm -hmm. you can't, it's impossible. Um, but something with like jazz for example, we don't have 3,000 performances so it's much easier to go into each venue and put in pictures and things like that. So do we want people to be able to draw conclusions from them from merely just looking at the sheer number of performances and where they're at or do we want them to be able to understand what we're saying through going through and digging deeper into like pop-up configura configurations and things like that. My question is just really, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing this. I really love this project. Um, I'm wondering, um, I'm intrigued by the question of informal venues or venues that would maybe not have advertised in the newspapers that you're looking at and stuff. Do you have ideas about where you would find that history of where else music was made besides the formal venues? Yeah, so we, um, the language barrier became a real difficulty here. Um, I speak French, and so if there were French newspapers, those we could tackle. Um, but we know of some newsletters that were circulating um, within Russian immigrants to France, within Czech immigrants to France, within Hungarian immigrants to France. Um, and neither of us speak any of those languages. Um, and so even though we knew that these newsletters exist, we have no way right now of going through and seeing what kinds of music they were talking about, what kinds of events they were advertising. Um, and even with jazz, um, often like the restaurants themselves were advertised, the specific performances weren't. Um, it was just a, kind of an assumption that whenever you go to Brick Tops at any time of day, on any day of the week, there's going to be somebody there performing. So. Are you all students of music? We are. <laughs> and is this project an independent study? How is your work on it structured? Um, we are, so St. Olaf has, um, across all of its different departments, a summer undergraduate research program um, that students will apply for and professors uh, will propose a project and then hire specific students to work on that project with them. Um, so this was kind of a 10 week um, summer program where we worked. All day. <laughs> <laughs> it's all for two. No, not entirely. <laughs> I mean, also, uh, so there was. probably highlight that there yeah. was uh, just the second year that this project has been going on. So in the summer of 2015, um, there was another team of four students with the same professor who kicked it off. So we're just continuing their work. And our professor also, um, fall semester of last year, so fall of 2015, taught a class about music history in 1920s Paris. Um, and so like if you go on the research blog, the vast majority of those posts were written by people in that class um, about <coughs> specific subtopics that they researched, like a specific orchestra or a specific concert hall, things like that. That being said, our work with like the Ballet and a lot of the jazz. Ballet Rus as well. <laughs> that was that was all things. Mostly <laughs> Template for people to just start pouring the data.